good morning, afternoon, and ev evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you for participating in today's webinar. My name is Kavanaugh Livingston, and I'm a senior program associate at the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves. The Alliance is very pleased to collaborate with Dr. Brendan Barnes, a professor of psychology at the University of Johannesburg, to present on applying behavior change critiques to strengthen interventions in the clean cooking sector. This webinar, designed for new and existing partners, is part of a series that promotes learnings and knowledge around evidence-based behavior change interventions in the clean cooking sector. During the session, Dr. Barnes will discuss a literature review of critiques of health behavior change programs through efficacy, structural ethics, and governance lenses. My colleague, Julie Ipe, will begin with some context setting and will serve as a discussant, discussant to help elaborate on some of the key points from Dr. Barnes' presentation before the Q&A session. To which, I'll hand over the reins to Julie. Julie, take it away. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much, Kavanaugh, and thanks, everybody, for joining today. Um, as Kavanaugh mentioned, we really see this as a series of webinars and opportunities to disseminate, uh, you know, some lessons learned and do some knowledge sharing on uh, behavior change within the clean cooking sector. So hopefully you've joined some of our other webinars and um, have found those useful. So um, before we kick off the main presentation, I just wanted to provide a very brief overview of the Alliance's demand and behavior change program as a bit of context for this webinar. Um, so as the Alliance, we I would say we spent the first few years um, of our existence focused on uh, really supporting the build out of the supply side. Uh, and this is through our support to enterprises and efforts to drive investment into the sector. And then also really focused on creating the enabling environment for a clean cook stove and fuel market. So establishing standards, uh, furthering the evidence base on why it's so important to address this issue, uh, and really establishing this issue firmly within the global agenda. So it wasn't really until 2015 that we started to place a lot of emphasis on the demand side. Uh, and of course, when I talk about demand, I always like to clarify that as the Alliance, we are not selling any one product, of course, but rather trying to raise demand um, and catalyze behavior change across the clean cooking sector. And what we had always heard from our partners in terms of how we can really add value there and sort of help lift um, all of our partners was, um, you know, to, to raise awareness at scale in the countries where our partners are working about this idea or concept of, of clean cooking, um, inform people about the options that are available, and importantly, of course, motivate people to start to prioritize clean cooking and prioritize purchasing um, the, you know, the better options that we all know about, and then, of course, continually using them. So our approach has been, um, again, to, to really reach people at scale and empower them with information so that they can make an infor informed choice about which clean uh, cook stove or fuel um, is best for their family's needs. And then, of course, we want to, to motivate them to, to make that switch. Um, so that's that's sort of one of our key goals. To date, we've supported interventions in six countries, reaching close to 40 million people with messaging about clean cooking. Um, but you know, another part of our goal, and, and really an important one, is to continue to build this evidence base on what approaches are actually most effective within the clean cooking sector, in driving purchase and use. So we see um, you know, this webinar series as well as some of our uh, tools and resources that we produce um, is really furthering that goal. So just very briefly, I'll talk a little bit about some of the, the work we've done um, in some of our focused countries. So we, as I said, we've supported about six interventions, um, or sorry, we've supported interventions in six countries. So uh, and testing really a range of approaches um, from mass media. We have a reality TV show in Kenya called Shamba Chef, um, which has been really exciting and really successful. We had about 3 million viewers in the first season. Um, in Nigeria, we uh, did a lot of work with social media and radio programming and complemented that with the more traditional door-to-door -door outreach. Uh, in Kenya, we had another community-based outreach campaign called Upishi DG, where we worked with uh, PS Kenya. And then um, in Bangladesh, we um, again took this very community-focused approach 
with our modern kitchen campaign. So the idea here is, of course, that we want to reach people, but also start to test a lot of different approaches so that we can start to learn within the clean cooking sector what works and what doesn't work. Um, and we are evaluating this work and we'll, of course, um, share those results so that they're available for people so that they can learn from them. Um, but, you know, just as a bit of context for this particular webinar, I think what is also really important is that we learn not just from what we're doing as the Alliance and what other others in the clean cooking sector are doing to um, drive behavior change, but also looking at other sectors. So, um, you know, what has been done in health and sanitation, reproductive health, et cetera, um, and what can we learn from that? And so um, really pleased today that we'll hear from Professor Barnes, who has actually has, has taken a, a really critical look at how behavior change has been approached um, for some other issues, particularly health, and done some thinking about how we can apply these lessons uh, to the cooking sector. So I think this will be a really nice opportunity to sort of look outside the cook, cook stove sector for a little bit um, and think about you know, how, what can we learn and how can we apply that. So um, really quickly, before I hand things over to Brendan, just wanted to make a quick plug for um, what we call our behavior change uh, communication resource hub. And this is where um, this is available on our website. And um, the idea of the hub was, of course, um, to sort of provide a one-stop shop where people could find uh, various resources that have been used uh, within the clean cooking sector to raise awareness and uh, market products and change behaviors. So uh, I encourage you to check it out. We, um, you know, you'll find lots of different materials, print, radio, TV, uh, et cetera, from campaigns from all over the world. So we hope that you'll use those to, to you know, the, to get some inspiration in designing your own work. And then we're always, um, you know, welcoming new materials. So if you have something you want to submit, uh, please do send that to us at knowledge at cleancooksos.org. So my quick plug. Um, and with that, I will hand things over to Brendan. Thank you, Julie. Um, <clears throat> thanks for that really um, quick um, introduction to the, the work of the Global Alliance. Um, by uh, way of introduction, my name is Brendan Barnes. I'm a professor of psychology at the University of Johannesburg. And I've been involved um, in the field of behavior change and um, clean cooking for a, a couple of years now. Um, uh, before I begin the presentation, I just wanted to also thank the Alliance for, for hosting this talk, um, as well as Kavanaugh for setting it up and, and, and Judy for that for that introduction. Um, <clears throat> I also need to acknowledge just how much good work has gone into collating and synthesizing and creating knowledge hubs about behavior change, uh, largely through the work of the Alliance. Um, at one point, there were just a handful of us, uh, mostly researchers, doing work on this topic, and it really is flourishing at the moment, I believe, um, as um, you can probably tell. Um, my background is in psychology and public health. Um, I'm particularly interested in merging the two um, and particularly interested in behavior change and some of the, the, the underlying motivations and barriers to behavior change. This talk is, is influenced by a couple of experiences I've had with behavior change and using behavior change in the field of environmental health broadly and household energy more specifically. Um, it's also influenced by the context in which I do my work and that is in South Africa, uh, post-democracy South Africa, where there is a lot of development and poverty alleviation initiatives. But amongst uh, practitioners, there's also a sense of the need to be reflexive um, and being careful of not unintentionally causing harm um, and reproducing some of the, the horrible inequalities that happened in the past in this particular country, as well as in um, the context in which I work. Next slide, please. So allow me to begin with a, with a story. Um, this story goes all the way back to the year 2000, um, where um, my interest in behavior change and, and household energy uh, started. Um, hopefully it's a story also that many of you who have been involved in behavior change 
will 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 see some similarity and it perhaps might resonate with you in terms of how complicated behavior change can be. Um, in 2000 and early 2001, um, USAID were interested in the question of behavior change and whether or not behavior change could reduce household air pollution. Now, this was not a new question, but I think it was driven at that point by the sense that there was um, certainly a, a need to focus on demand and the uptake of clean technologies and so forth. But for me, there was also another uh, 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 imperative, and that was to see if we could change people's behaviors without um, simple behavior change. And the question of whether or not this could work was an important one. Also, whether or not behavior change could have a knock-on effect on public health. So the context in which the study took place was rural South Africa. It was unelectrified. Um, people burned uh, using biomass fuels in summer, mostly outdoors, but in winter, uh, very cold winter months, most of the cooking happened um, indoors. The context was also one of abject poverty, where um, fuel wood was collected, as in the, the, the picture on the left, free of charge, and it was a real prime context for the risk of household air pollution, but also a context in which um, technology, or at least pre-improved technologies, would take a while to, to get going. So our job really, uh, my job as principal investigator, was to see whether or not we could design an intervention um, to alleviate the issue. Of course, I did lots of homework, um, doing formative research in the communities in which I was working. I spent a lot of time observing and trying to understand how and why people used different uh, fuels and how that may or may not could, uh, how those behaviors could be modified. But in a nutshell, came up with a very cool, I thought at the time, quasi-experimental study using two communities. The first community, we decided to initiate a behavior change, theoretically informed behavior change intervention, where we would measure our indicators before and after the intervention was implemented. Our indicators were household air pollution, behaviors related to fuel use, as well as respiratory health indicators of young children. We measured the, all of those before we intervened, and then we measured um, all those indicators again for a year afterwards. Our control community was um, very similar in nature, but far away enough from our intervention community to um, not be influenced by the intervention, uh, or so we thought. Um, again, we measured household air pollution indicators, child respiratory health indicators, and behavior change indicators. What happened over the course of the year or after a year was very interesting. Of course, we found um, that behaviors improved um, to, to, to the level that which we had hoped they would. Household air pollution improved and to, for, to, to a small extent, uh, respiratory health improved. The really interesting part of the story, however, is that um, in the control group community, the community, in other words, that didn't get our intervention, we saw improvements to similar degrees. So this was a, a real head scratcher for us. In fact, uh, maybe that's putting it mildly, I was uh, very disappointed. Uh, I couldn't understand why the control group who didn't receive our intervention actually showed improvement uh, in what could be called a Hawthorne effect. So I spent several months with this control community um, to try and understand what exactly went on. And it turns out that they, simply through participating in the study, took it upon themselves to lobby for uh, electricity that they weren't supposed to get. They lobbied for other basic services as well and used the name of um, the company that I was working for at the time to mobilize and use activism to get, uh, in, in a nutshell, clean cooking um, technology. So this really did call into question a number of things for me. Number one, it called into question the assumptions that I had started off with about behavior change. It also um, really compelled me to think through what is it that we are asking people to do when we do, or at least engage in behavior change? And also, it compelled me to look for a literature, perhaps, 
that could guide me in terms of what went wrong or right, I suppose, depending on how you look at it. And so this got me thinking uh, really about critique and behavior change change critique and it sort of led me to start reading about you know behavior change more broadly how we do it and how we should do it better but also critiques of health behavior change so the starting point was that health behavior change programs are common in a number of sectors as Julie pointed out um, these include water and sanitation insecticide treated bed nets household energy and clean cooking and so we can go on and on and on um, but there are also various critiques of health behavior change that also present quite interesting alternative ways of thinking about the the um, about behavior change. So I was led to do a narrative review of critiques of behavior change, and particularly to ask the question, um, you know, what can we learn from critiques of behavior change? So there were two questions that drove me. Um, or, or continue to, to, to drive me. The, the first is that, what are critiques of health behavior change critical of? Um, and secondly, how can lessons from those critiques be used to strengthen behavior change interventions in the clean, clean cooking sector? Next slide, please. So, to begin with, it's really important to acknowledge the complexity of the issues we face. Um, firstly, we have to acknowledge the complexity of household energy and energy systems globally and regionally. Um, we do know that the starting point for much of our work is the fact that 3 billion or so people are still reliant on dirty fuels. We also know that even when clean cooking occurs, that stove stacking and fuel mixing is, is a common occurrence. We also need to acknowledge the complexity of the sheer number of products around and thousands and thousands of technologies around um, that would more or less fall into the category of clean cooking. There's also complexity in terms of the outcomes. We have health outcomes, safety outcomes, quality of life outcomes, well-being outcomes, environmental outcomes, as well as poverty alleviation outcomes. And even within those broad categories, there are differences in terms of what we consider an outcome of, a, of an intervention to be. It's also important to acknowledge the implementation complexity related to behavior change. There are a number of different behavior change techniques, as well as a number of ways in which behavior has been uh, conceptualized. For example, the two main ways are that behavior change is a process to aid in the demand and uptake of clean cooking technologies. But there is also an alternative reading, and that's behavior change as an outcome in itself. Um, you know, opening windows and doors, small um, doable actions that may or may not have an impact on, on what we're looking at. We have to acknowledge the context, of course, the variety of uh, contexts in which we operate, that various actors that are involved in clean cooking, as well as the legal and justice, justice frameworks, the issue of culture and cultural systems um, that sometimes come out quite clearly and starkly in the literature. And then, of course, the, the, the issue of behavior change and the complexity thereof. Um, behavior change, as you would probably know, is highly complicated. Um, from a scholarly perspective, for example, uh, at the moment we know of 93 different behavior change techniques. And I'm sure since 2017, when those were published, there are more. There are well over 80 theories and well over 1,700 constructs that have been identified um, by the scholarly literature. That, of course, excludes our experiential um, learning of behavior change. And I'm sure many of you listening today would know how difficult it is to change a behavior. How many of you, for example, have started um, an eating plan or exercise plan and have um, not made many gains? So behavior change is complicated. And especially uh, for us, the ways in which we can elicit and nudge people for want of a, a, a better word in the right direction. Next slide, please. So critiques of health behavior change, um, much to my surprise at the time, were, were, were quite active. And what I did is I have classified them into four different levels of critique. Next slide, please. FSC critiques really ask the question, do behavioral interventions work? 
Well, this is a question that's also been asked in a number of other sectors, but as well as uh, it's been asked in sort of cross-cutting work to try and understand uh, the effectiveness of behavior change interventions. Unsurprisingly, the evidence is quite patchy. Um, some studies show effectiveness and others do not. In fact, uh, unfortunately, the majority do not show evidence, <laughs> uh, much evidence, but this is partly because of the methodological problems or the methodological framing of studies. So if a study has a relatively weak methodology, it's very difficult to say with any degree of confidence whether that uh, or how much that intervention worked or not. Something that's really intrigued me is the role of theory um, and how do we draw on theory in the design, intervention, as well as the evaluation of studies um, and to what extent do we do, we do that. What we also find is that many of the behavior change interventions in the uh, household energy sector show a, a very promising impact in control studies, but lose their impact at scale. They also lose impact over time. I just wanted to draw your attention to two reviews that have been conducted on this very topic. Um, you know, how effective are, are, are interventions? And the first is by uh, Nick Goodwin and, and et al. Um, and the second is uh, one done by me. I'd, I'd encourage you to have a look at that um, and to also think through the question of how do we improve the effectiveness as well as the evaluation of the interventions. Next slide, please. Structural critiques are Critiques of, structural critiques are perhaps the, the more, most common um, out of all the critiques and this is where people have looked at the assumptions and particularly the assumptions of individualism um, that underpin many of our behavior change interventions and that is you know you have a person who thinks we hope uh, who feels, who might have thoughts, who might have opinions, uh, who's situated in a particular community or social structure, whose mind essentially can be changed to promote a particular end. Um, and usually if the assumption is if, if enough people change their behaviors or at least change their minds and then change their behaviors, um, and then we'll have a knock-on effect, a ripple effect if you like, um, that can carry on into a number of other, that can have an impact. But um, it, obviously individualism and this way of thinking uh, about um, behavior change has a number of um, uh, limitations. The first and probably most interesting is that beneficiaries often are typically have a good understanding of the problems affecting them um, and that actually improving their knowledge um, of a particular issue might not be the best way to do this. There are also very important structural factors such as poverty, the social determinants of health, and so forth that really might play a role in uh, barriers, of, uh, representing barriers to behavior change. There's also an interesting literature coming out that in fact income inequality might be a, a stronger driver of health behavior change than perhaps an assumption that people don't know any better. So structural critiques provide alternative accounts for the determinants of behavior change and often these are uh, accounts that we could call upstream accounts um, that might be influencing behavior change. Next slide, please. Ethics critiques um, ask the question, is it ethical um, to use behavior change in certain contexts? So for example, is it ethical to promote interventions when the evidence is weak? And of course, there's a counter argument there to suggest that we should always be, have the precautionary principle in the forefront of our thinking, um, that we don't need to wait for evidence to implement interventions, and perhaps we should be engaging with behavior change more robustly instead of waiting for evidence. A further ethical problem is gender and victim blaming. It's quite common to, um, for interventions to be targeting, rightfully or wrongly, uh, women, and in, in a nutshell, what implications does this have for gender and for the idea that we, are may, we may be placing the source and the problem of behavior change or health or anything else that we're interested in um, are fair, is squarely on the shoulders of the victim? Um, 
There's also evidence to suggest that behavior change works in those who can afford it, um, so thereby increasing inequality. So the, the poor, or the poorest of the poor, who wouldn't be able to, for example, in, afford improved technologies, might actually um, not participate in such programs, and those who could afford it uh, inadvertently use and uh, take up um, um, our interventions are better than those who cannot afford it. There are also instances where behavior change is implemented at scale with little or no choice, and, and unfortunately this does happen, um, and we certainly in my country have uh, various examples of that, um, and I know of various other contexts in which um, governments have forced technologies onto participants. There's also a very interesting literature on the unintended consequences of behavior change. Of, for example, when insecticide treated bed nets get used for fishing nets and so forth, and it has unintended consequences on environmental um, indicators. So, next slide, please. The fourth set of critiques, uh, very quickly, and uh, th these are much more complicated and stem mainly from uh, the legal literature as well as the political science literature, is the relationship between the citizens and the state. What exactly are we doing when we think through uh, behavior change and its relationship to citizenship? There is a lot of critique of central or centrist neoliberal politics and of public-private partnerships. There is also interesting literature showing um, how behavior change might form part of a third way in doing um, public health or development and, and some of the limitations of that. Um, I guess the take home message from the governance critiques without going into too much detail about them is that um, communities are often seeking um, or, or located within certain governance structures and ways of thinking around the politics of interventions and this may serve, for example, to undermine many of the behavior change interventions that currently exist. Next slide, please. So, rather than prescriptions or recommendations, I thought of maybe just raising questions around these critiques that we, or sh we, 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 we can and should think through when we are designing behavior change interventions. So rather than see critique as something that's anti-behavior change, my view at this point is perhaps to incorporate some of those questions that are raised by the uh, literature and the scholarly literature and, and as well as practical experience um, and to ask questions that might be useful uh, in the design and implementation of behavior change interventions. So the first set of questions relate to the efficacy critiques. How strong is the evidence of the effectiveness of behavior change on clean cooking? And certainly we know it is not very strong and the, the Alliance is doing fabulous work, I should add, um, to strengthening the evidence. But how can we strengthen the evidence basis? The second question, is it possible or desirable to develop a set of universal measurement indicators to measure behavior change? Knowing full well that we are, have a number of indicators and the talk has begun to do exactly this, led predominantly by the Alliance. Importantly for me and often overlooked are what are the theoretical underpinnings of programs? To what extent do programs incorporate theory or theory of change? into their understandings of the interventions. From structural critiques, I ask questions around what are the structural factors um, that typically either enhance or serve as barriers to behavior change and ones that many behavior change interventions perhaps overlook. Next slide, please. Have we sufficiently acknowledged gender in programs? What about culture? What are the possible unintended consequences of programs? At this point, it's important maybe to just stop and reflect also from, a, from quite a big literature that came out in the 70s and early 80s on improved cook stove programs. Uh, vastly different time, but there are lots of interesting lessons that uh, could perhaps be gleaned from that moment in history. How do we consider or have we considered local politics and governance issues in behavior change? And what are the implications of overlooking some of these structural factors? 
what can we learn from behavior change in other sectors, for example, in public health or in any other sector for that matter? And to what extent have we incorporated beneficiary voices into the programs? It certainly was a, an issue in the, the example I started off this presentation with, uh, in that um, despite the beneficiaries telling me over and over and again that they didn't necessarily want to change their behaviors, that they actually wanted the electricity to cook with, I kept telling them that this was not going to happen because they wouldn't be able to afford electricity and so forth. Uh, but in, in the end, uh, it would have been more useful to have incorporated some of those voices uh, in terms of how I designed that intervention um, and evaluated it. Next slide, please. Again, I'll ask more uh, sort of upstream uh, questions around political and governance issues as per local context, also the rise of social movements and activism in relation to household energy that we're seeing cropping up uh, around the world. How can we um, partner or at least think through some of those issues that they're raising in terms of our programs? Um, and also just to acknowledge that behavior change and clean cooking and um, household energy uh, is both old and new. And how, do, how can we speed up collation efforts in relation to what works and under what conditions? And this is really important and it's something I know the Alliance is working on. And I just encourage us all to be able to um, contribute to that knowledge hub that's existing. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, um, I, I guess um, I'm suggesting that behavior change, the field of behavior change and behavioral change science and behavioral, ch behavioral change techniques is really developing at quite a rapid pace. Um, we're starting to understand the power of behavior change, but I think at the same time, it's important to listen to the limits of behavior change, to understand what the critiques are of behavior change. Importantly, I think we need to see how we can use critiques to strengthen interventions and not simply ignore them or to push them aside. I uh, have thought for a long time on how I would do my own behavior change differently, knowing what I know now. And I think there are many ways in which I would um, have done my studies, especially earlier studies differently and perhaps more effectively. So in a nutshell, I'm gonna stop there and allow more time for um, talking, but I, I hope this talk will uh, perhaps enlighten people as to um, the broader field of critique and perhaps how their usefulness um, in terms of behavior change. So I'll stop there, um, Kevin, if that's okay. Thank you. on some of your terrific points, um, Brandon, and then we'll go into Q&A. Thanks again. Yeah, great. Thanks so much, Kevin, and, and thanks again to Brendan for that really uh, fascinating and I'd say thought-provoking presentation. You know, I was as I was listening, I was thinking of so many things that um, we, we are challenged with every day and working in this sector, particularly on, on the behavior change side. Um, and I can tell you, working more on the implementation side, we see these challenges every day, um, but don't quite think of them as, you know, in such an organized and eloquent way. So it's really useful to hear you talk through some of those. Um, for me, at least, I, I already have lots of thoughts running through my mind. Um, so just a few things I wanted to highlight, and I certainly uh, will not be able to answer all of your questions, <laughs> nor is, I think that's the, I don't think that's the expectation, but just thinking about some of, some of the ones that you raised, um, what kept coming back for me is, is really this idea of, um, you know, as you said, there's so many theories out there and so many techniques. Um, and as, as a sector, I think we're trying to be a little bit more systematic about applying those um, in the work that we do. And, and as we've been saying throughout building from, from what we know has worked in other sectors. But I can also say that the, the sort of reality of trying to implement those things in practice is often, you know, it's a little, it's, a, it's different than what you, maybe you, you went into the project thinking you're going to do just because of all of the sort of other factors in play, um, the realities of the you know, situations or the context that you're working in, um, the supply of the products, uh, the affordability issues, which you highlighted, 
Um, so it's it's interesting to you know to to see that um, you know the theory is so important, uh, and uh, we we try to you know think about it as much as possible in, in the work that we do. But um, you know sometimes it's it's lost in the implementation for better or worse. Um, and as you say, it's also you know the the sort of impact can be lost when you start to scale and try and reach. Uh, a, a broader population and then of course over time we see that if there isn't follow-up and there isn't continued um, sort of uh, you know behavioral change interventions that we start to see people revert to you know previous uh, stoves or fuels that they've been using so uh, we also see that as an important priority for the alliance in the in the coming years is to continue to um, ensure that people are consistently using the, the cleaner products um, yeah, so I, I think, you know, the other thing that I always like to highlight when we talk about uh, behavior change in the cookie, cooking sector and, and really any sector, particularly when we're working with uh, resource constrained uh, populations is that, you know, people have the, the realities of real life, right? So they have competing priorities, uh, they have limited budgets, and they are rightly so quite risk averse. So and, and cooking is really an int integral part of life. So what we're asking people to do in terms of the behavioral change is is quite a, a big ask. Um, you know, investing in a new stove is it, is itself a substantial purchase. It's basically an, an appliance. I know for me, if I was going to go out and buy a new stove, I would think very carefully about what that would be and how much I would like to spend. Um, and in cases where we're asking people to start using a different fuel, that's also a huge leap. I always use the example of, you know, someone knocked on my door and said, you know, you should you should switch from gas, which is what I use now, to ethanol, let's say. I would have a lot of questions and concerns. So how is this going to change my cooking experience? Um, is the fuel supply reliable? Is it regulated by the government? Um, are my neighbors doing this? Is this what everybody's doing? I mean, these are real questions that we would all ask. So I think that's another thing that we need to keep in mind is that, uh, you know, this takes time and it's, um, you know, it's it's a huge leap for people. So I always just like to remind people of that when we're, when we're thinking about this. Um, yeah, so I think, I think maybe I'll stop there. Um, actually, one, one last thing I'll say is I really liked um, Brendan's point about incorporating uh, beneficiary voices, because I think that is, you know, we couldn't agree more that that is critically important. And it's something that as the Alliance, we have always tried to do, you know, our first step when we are designing any intervention is to first talk to the people that we're trying to reach and understand from them sort of, you know, what are their their main barriers and in, in making the transition to clean cooking, um, and what are the motivators? So what are they interested in? What would be most compelling to them? And what do they want? So, um, you know, I couldn't agree more. And I would encourage anyone who's doing this type of work to always start with the beneficiaries first and build from there. So uh, I'm sure people have lots of questions and maybe some comments. So with that, I think I'll, I'll stop and see if we have some questions from the audience. Great. Thank you so much, Julie. Yes, we have a few. So. Um, Let's begin the Q&A. <clears throat> All right, so we have, oops, let me take mine. Okay. All right, so we'll start with the first one. Um, we have a, um, an audience member that um, wanted to just uh, let you know, Brendan, that they appreciated the uh, your comment regarding the evidence to suggest that behavior change change works on those who can afford it, therefore increasing income inequality. Um, and then to that question, the um, audience member asks, are there any best practices for bridging these the gaps between awareness and demand on the one hand and accessibility on the other? Uh, yeah, so any thoughts or uh, comments to that, Brendan? And of course, Julie, please jump in. Um, I can't think of any best practice uh, yet in this particular sector, but I would encourage um, people to read more broadly. I mean, the um, the uh, Behavior Change Center, Susan Mickey's group has done an extensive amount of work, um, cross-cutting work, to try and um, 
consolidate some of the lessons learned. But um, for, for me, uh, fr from this, the literature at least, I can't think of anything um, to answer that question. But I think from projects, certainly, the, um, Julie, you might speak to some projects that you think were successful in doing that. Uh, sure, yeah, I wish I could point to lots of projects where we've done this successfully, but to be honest, um, you know, in my sort of tenure in the, in the cooking sector, I would say that this has been an ongoing conundrum for us where, um, especially because we have, uh, we've taken a market-based approach and the idea is mm -hmm. that we're getting people to actually purchase the stove. So what we find is that, of course, the populations who are best poised to purchase the stoves tend to be the ones who are are better off, obviously. And so um, it, it really is something that we have struggled with over the years. I'll just be super honest. Um, I think often what we point to as a potential solution is to, um, to help the enterprises that we work with um, be able to offer financing options for people so that they don't have to pay for a stove completely upfront or to partner with uh, MFIs or other organizations who can offer financing. Um, and that has worked in a lot of cases. I'd say that's sort of the best we have so far um, in terms of the solution there. Uh, and, you know, of course, the other option is just subsidies, which has also been tried in the, the cooking sector um, with some mixed results. And, you know, some people have their own opinions about that approach. But, you know, I it, it, it's a challenge. I mean, it really is. Um, it's a challenge in general, as I said before, working in populations who are you know, pretty resource constrained. Um, and uh, like I said, it, it's asking them to to take a pretty big risk in terms of um, making a transition to a new stove or even a fuel. So it's one that, um, you know, we, we continue to try to solve, but I wouldn't say that we have necessarily cracked it yet. <laughs> so if, if people have ideas, if they've worked in other sectors and seen um, you know, other approaches work, we're always welcome to, to hear about those. Great. Thank you, Brendan and Julie, uh, for your contribution to that question. Um, we'll move on to the, another one. Um, this question may be a little bit on the flip side, actually, of uh, this discussion. It, and the audience member asks, um, uh, what are actually some of the main motivations for people to change their cooking behavior. Um, so what, yeah, what are the kind of drivers uh, for them to um, pursue a change in behavior with regards to energy and cooking? Yeah, so I can I can take that one to the start and then Brendan, please add as you yeah. see But what we have found overwhelmingly, and this is across, you know, uh, the countries in Africa where we've worked in Kenya and Ghana, um, in South Asia and India, Bangladesh, is that overwhelmingly people are motivated by um, aspiration. So they see, you know, if they see that uh, moving on to a better cook stove or a different fuel is what uh, everybody else is doing and would make them seem modern and seem like they're, they're, you know, successful and sort of keeping up with the Joneses is the term we would use in the U.S., then that is, that is very attractive to them. The other thing that seems very motivating and attractive to people is this idea of convenience. So of course, I think that's a universal thing, right? Like everybody wants a little bit more convenience in their lives and um, you know, the people that we're trying to reach here are no different. So that's another really motivating factor. And then the other thing that we found is also this idea of cleanliness um, is, is really compelling to people. So this idea that you could have a home without soot on the walls, that um, you wouldn't smell like smoke, that, uh, you know, one one story that we, we like to share is uh, we had a woman in Nigeria come to um, a stakeholder meeting that we put together, and she commented on the fact that she can now wear white because she started using LPG, so she didn't have to worry about ash or smoke getting in her clothes. So that to her was really important. Um, and it's, it's probably something that, you know, a lot of people in the Think about this issue we're always thinking about the health or the environmental impacts that we could see um and those are important but you know it's it's other things like the in, the convenience the immediate comforts the cleanliness that actually seems to motivate people um uh to make the switch 
I, I completely agree. In fact, um, I was, my answer is almost exactly the same. I think um, in the studies that I've been involved with, it is uh, the the social status and um, the reflection perhaps of upward mobility that, that really is a big driver for for uh, success. Um, of course, in this convenience, as as Julie mentioned, and especially time. I think time in one on ones with women, uh, you know, it's time savings are are really important. Uh, funny enough, environmental concerns and health concerns fall way, way behind. And especially in public health, those two tend to take center stage. So um, yeah, I think uh, social status, or at least indicators or perceptions, putting your best foot forward in that regard um, can be quite powerful. Thanks. <laughs> Great, thank you, Julie and Brendan. Um, so these two questions go hand in hand a little bit. They're a little more geographically focused. One of them asks, um, um, is anyone aware of any studies, behavior change related studies that were conducted in the Western Pacific region? Um, this uh, this uh, question comes from someone based in the Solomon Islands. And then kind of on a broader level, um, is there a particularly dominant region or part of the world that um, that there tend to have been a lot of behavior change um, interventions, studies, results, and testing? Julie, do you want to go? <laughs> um, I was going to send it over to you. Uh, I, I, off the top of my head, I don't know in any that worse of any uh, reviews that have been done in the Western Pacific region. Um, it's not to say that there haven't been any, but none of them come immediately to mind for me. I would say regions where uh, you see a more dominant focus would probably be in Africa and South Asia. I think that's where a lot of the literature comes from. But um, Brendan, if you have more intel, please share. <laughs> um. Yeah, I agree about Africa and Asia. I don't know of any studies in Western in the Western Pacific. I would also add uh, Latin America or South America more specifically. Um, there's been a lot of activity in, in, in that area, uh, not so much framed uh, in a behavioral change kind of um, perspective, but um, certainly a lot of the improved cook stove work and epidemiological studies and so forth have emanated from, from that region. Thank you. Um, so we have, I think, a, a nice forward looking question here and the uh, audience member asks, um, what would success for the clean cooking sector look like in 25 years um, and whether that's related to how behavior change impacts that or how behavior change can contribute to that future? Um, any amusings or thoughts on this question? That's an excellent question. Um, I, I mean, we have a number of frameworks that I think are meant to guide us in this regard. So the sustainable development goals that sees between, by 2030, I think global coverage of electricity. Um, but we, we do know the complexity of, of uh, household energy and, uh, and, and I wish I could be confident in achieving that because uh, even though we do have um, uh, access to clean energy and clean cooking, uh, we, we also know that the, the problem of dirty fuels persist. So unless we change um, more, more upstream factors together with behavior change, I guess this is another uh, uh, lesson I've learned from the critique literature that we're unlikely to, to get there um, as, as soon as 2030. Um, but I think uh, every effort should matter and every effort should count. Um, and the, the, yeah, okay, I'll leave it there. Um, so, so yeah, I would, I would refer back to the sustainable development goals, um, as well as linking with uh, renewable energy, um, some of the discussions happening there. Thank you. Yeah, and maybe just quickly to add to that, I um, I agree. It's, a, it's still a huge challenge, right? We're still talking about 3 billion people, um, you know, cooking with dirty fuel. So, and as we've mentioned throughout uh, what we find is that people often mix fuels and use multiple stoves. So I think getting to this point where we feel, you know, like where people fully transitioned will take quite some time. And um, but also to say that that's okay. I mean, it is a it's a transition. It should happen over time. Um, and yeah, I would just 
definitely echo what Brendan said that a lot of things need to happen sort of upstream as well. So that's where, as the Alliance, we try and work on all facets of this issue, which um, is exciting and challenging at the same time. You know, we need to see change in the supply side, but also in, in policy and, in, you know, making sure that uh, fuels are regulated, that there are standards for the stoves. Um, and, uh, and, and really getting people to continue to prioritize this issue and uh, getting some real investment in it, because um, that's the other thing that we've seen is, you know, we, we're still very under-resourced um, in the clean cooking sector. Uh, uh, you know, I was recently at a conference on energy access, and it still amazes me that most of the conversations are about electrification and only... Mm -hmm you know, a hand, handful of people will mention mm. cooking as sort of an afterthought. And so I think there still is work to do um, to continue mm. to get people um, to prioritize this issue and really make it a, an integral part of the sort of global development agenda. Mm. Good, I think we can uh, um, continue on with these terrific questions. Um, so, and uh, I hope I will, if I understand this question correctly, and uh, so Brian and Julie, uh, feel free to have some creative license interpretation. Um, but so in reference to um, the, I believe this is a, a theory, um, the self-sufficiency assumption with regards to the theory of planned behavior, which according to this audience member is um, potentially quite contested. So with this, um, framework in mind, um, the audience member asks, regarding the point of uh, individual, individualism overlooks a number of other determinants, the question is, um, do you think that we could hypothesize that the effect of objective measurements, um, such as income level, education level, and behavior is mediated via these subjective perceptions? Um, yeah, so... Maybe Brandon, do you want to take an initial stab at this? Oh boy, that's a difficult one. Can you repeat it, please? Sorry, I, I, sure. I actually need to. Write. Um, yeah, I, I. So I think, yeah, maybe if whoever the audience member asked me, feel free to clarify, and I'm happy to read aloud the clarification. Yeah, but the question is, um, they state uh, regarding the point that individualism overlooks a number of other determinants. Um, do you think that the effect of objective measurements um, of individuals, like their income level and education, for example, on their behavior is mediated um, somehow through subjective perceptions of these of these um, of these measurements of these objective measurements? Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll... I'll give it a go. Um, and there's a lot of literature in, in the, the health um, sector um, about uh, subjective perceptions and their role in moderating or mediating other measures. Um, so at the moment in this particular sector, I don't think it's, in fact, I don't, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know of a study. In the review I did in 2014, for example, just one study made reference to one particular model or theory out of all these studies that we, that I reviewed. So I, I don't even think we're close to actually uh, knowing that. Whether or not we can hypothesize it, I think my, my personal opinion is that individual perceptions actually play quite a minor role in terms of um, determining behavior in relation to clean cooking. Um, I would love to get involved in more uh, work to try and drill down a bit in terms of subjectivity and individual perceptions, but at the moment, I just don't know. Um, but, but based on experience and based on what we know about the sector, then I think the more upstream, or at least if, the, the, the more uh, out of the person's head and into the social family community realm, I think those kinds of indicators would be more powerful. But again, um, it's a question that I'd, 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 I'd love to see attempted answered. I hope that helps. Yeah, thank you. That is absolutely very helpful. Um, I think we have time for a few more questions since we um, began five minutes later than the scheduled time. So, um, 
here for this question. Um, so Brendan and Julie, maybe just a few short concrete examples might be more helpful. And the question asks, um, what are some best practices that can be applied in the rural context to impact and increase adoption and uptake of the clean cooking sector? Um, and how can behavior change most effectively? What are some best practices around behavior change that can um, contribute to this goal? Judy, do you want to go? <laughs> sure, I can try. Um, yeah, I, so specifically in rural areas, I think uh, it's always going to be more challenging just because that's often where we find people who are probably a bit more resource constrained, but also, um, you know, that it's, there's just not as much density in terms of being able to reach people. So it's always more expensive um, when you're when you're doing anything communication based or trying to demonstrate the, the product. So I would just of course, keep that in mind and anything you do, not that you shouldn't try, but just understanding that um, it will be likely more resource intensive and approach that an approach that we have taken in um, more rural or peri-urban areas is really just going out uh, door to door and talking to people, talking through the options um, and then conducting follow up visits as well. And, um, you know, trying to bring people together and markets or central meeting areas where we can demonstrate the technologies um, and you know that way people are actually able to see them and see how they work so I, I think it's it's a it's a lot of um, sort of interpersonal communication demonstrating the products which is honestly what we do in any context but um, particularly in, in uh, sort of less urban areas and then of course as with any behavioral change intervention I think uh, repetition is key. So continuing to, to reach people, I, you know, it takes a, a few times before people really, before things really start to um, sort of settle with people and where they really start to seriously consider making a change. So repetition is always really important. And then I also think that um, focusing also on the sort of small doable actions that Brendan talked about is, is also a good approach um, in, in some areas. And maybe I'll let Brendan talk a bit more about that and and add any other comments he has. Yeah, just, just to add um, to that, I, I think one thing that um, I would encourage program designers to, to, to take note of is the need to do really, really understand the context. And I think much of the problem stems from um, uh, failing to do uh, formative work, you know, uh, formative evaluations, uh, needs assessments, and so forth. Often um, the, the impetus starts with perhaps the product um, or perhaps the success or at least perceived success of an enterprise and so forth. Um, but I think it's really important to understand the context. Um, and there are a number of resources to help with that. To answer your question directly, I don't think we, we have enough evidence at this point to allow for a discussion of best practices, particularly in a particular context. I think what we can do is highlight best practices in terms of processes. And those, then that's exactly one of those. Um, uh, really to try and understand the context. Um, and often I feel people um, really over, uh, completely overlook this step or at least undermine the potential power of understanding the context. Thanks. Thank you so much, Brendan and Julie. I think we'll, um, we'll take one more question and then we'll wrap it up after that. And apologies to those who we couldn't um, get to your questions, but Please feel free to email the Alliance at info at cleancookstoves.org with your any other questions and we'd be happy to follow up um, and respond to them. So um, this may be interesting and help widen a little bit beyond um, our sector a little bit. Um, the question is, uh, are both of you aware of any field research linking clean cooking marketing efforts to behavior change concepts? maybe even potentially the other way around. Um, so yeah, any interesting studies of how marketing um, within the sector or outside of it um, uses behavior change concepts and how behavior change maybe has been actually integrated into marketing from a business or commercial um, uh, efforts. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. You Go ahead, Brendan. <laughs> I was going to say, um, yeah, yeah, that's an interesting one. Uh, I mean, I think if you talk to anyone who works in marketing or advertising in any sector, they would say that they are inherently using behavior change concepts. Maybe 
uh, not always approaching it from a very theoretical perspective, but you know, that's essentially what most advertisers are doing is trying to, you know, get you to, uh, purchase their products or more of their products, um, than their competitors. So there's always a behavior change element there in terms of the clean cooking sector. Um, I can't think of any, uh, any specific research where, um, where people have looked at, again, how those concepts are applied in marketing efforts. Um, but it, it, yeah, it might be interesting to, for someone to look at that. I'm not a researcher, so if anyone's listening, <laughs> um, there you go. There's an idea. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, if, it, but if we do think of something, we can, of course, post that on our website, or um, if you follow up with us directly, we can share that. Um, I can refer you to Nick Goodwin's work, um, uh, to, to Lido. Um, there was also, uh, he, he did a piece, um, and, and he, he's, yeah, well, their work is really interesting because um, they, they're involved in a number of sectors, but they're also involved, um, they have done work um, reviewing many of the techniques that are used uh, in the clean cooking sector. The review I spoke about earlier appeared in the Journal of Health Communication. And uh, I think there are a few examples there um, that might speak sort of maybe indirectly to the question. And I think, that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, please, Julie, but I think, w w didn't the, um, the Alliance have a, um, a panel at the Social Marketing Conference? Uh, we did, recently yes. That focused on <laughs> social marketing. And so, so maybe, maybe, you know, some resources that, that emanated from there could be useful. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. And we, we've also had um, panels devoted to this topic, specifically how companies are marketing their products um, uh, at our Clean Cookie Forums. So would encourage people to check out those websites because they can find the presentations and um, you know, see who is presenting if you wanted to follow up for more information. Good. I think that um, concludes our webinar. Um, thank you, Brendan and Julie, so much for your terrific insights, um, for your discussions, and for engaging with the audience. And the Alliance would, of course, like to thank Brendan again for his time and for his terrific presentation. And finally, thank you, the audience, for joining us today. Uh, we really hope you found um, this presentation and the other points and comments that the audience members have brought up helpful, useful, and that you can apply some of these insights to your own work um, wherever you are in the sector. So um, please note that we have recorded this webinar. We'll be posting it on our various channels, and we encourage you to share um, this recording with in your networks and with your colleagues. Please do contact us, the Alliance, anytime at info at cleancookstoves.org with any questions on the webinar, with other suggestions, and any other ways that we can improve the webinar experience uh, for our partners. Have a great rest of the morning, afternoon, and evening, and we look forward to keeping in touch. Thank you.